good afternoon, good evening, depending on what time you uh, are watching this podcast. This series we call Race, Culture, and the Church. Race, Culture, and the Church. And again, as I like to remind everyone, think of it like the Venn diagrams with the three circles. Uh, you have race, you've got culture, and the church. And if we are successful, we'll intersect uh, all three circles if we're really successful. Uh, but most of the time, we'll hit two out of three. So I am pleased. I am, uh, I am absolutely thrilled to, int- to welcome into this space Chief Kathy Lester, Chief of Police for the Sacramento, California Police Department. Welcome. Thank you, Pastor. It's great to be here. It is wonderful to have you. Uh, you've been chief now how long? Um, I got sworn in right at the end of December, um, although we did the big public swearing in around March, so most people think that's about when I started, but, um, you know, 10 months now, 11 months, actually, I guess so, I'm starting. So the bump in pay started coming. That's 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 usually the, the measure that you, it's like, okay, the increase in pay came January 1st, so that's yeah. that's good. Happened all so fast that that's not what you pay attention to, for sure, <laughs> not in a job like this, it's not about well, the pay. Well, <laughs> you're a better person than I am. I would look at the pay stub. Okay, yeah, I did actually get the job, and it's, uh, I'm good. I will, uh, as I like to joke, but I don't joke, our Cracker Jack research team, that would be me, um, <laughs> has done a bit of research, not. Uh, we actually uh, just printed off some information from uh, SAC PD uh, website. And so if it's wrong, blame your... Uh, blame my own team. It's, it's my fault. It's, I it's I totally your fault. Well. Totally. Uh, <laughs> well, I think they did. They did a good job. So it must be true. Um, you joined the police department in 1994. Um, started out as a dispatcher, CSO, community service officer in 95, sworn uh, police officer in 96. And uh, I'll stop right there. Um, that's, that's interesting. Well, it says that you enlisted in the Army at 17. I did. So at some point... the 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 office that you're in was something that was on your radar, at least at the subconscious level, um, as a teenager? You know, not so much as a teenager, actually. Um, my dad had been a deputy up in Placer County um, for a little while when I was a kid. We lived in Truckee. Um, but he was an engineer by trade. And so he, he worked to, actually at a couple of different agencies, but um, ended up going back to engineering and took a job at McClellan, which is how we got down here. So I do remember as a little kid, you know, he would bring home the squad cars this is back in the 70s, you know, and uh, how how fun it was to go to soda with him, you know. Um, he'd t- take us in the car sometimes, but never really thought about being a police officer at that time. I was, um, I was in a program uh, through my high school in Sac State uh, called Academic Talent Search that led to a program called Accelerated college entrance. So I started taking classes at Sac State at night while I was going to high school during the day. Um, and I was really more interested in science. Um, I had taken a forensic science class, like CSI type class one summer, and I thought I would go into that branch. So I took a couple of basic criminal justice classes, but most of my college classes at that time were more on the hard science side of things. And then lo and behold, I got bored in high school, decided I just didn't need to go anymore and promptly became a chronic truant and dropped out, got kicked out, depending on which way you look at it, about halfway through my senior year. So I found myself um, not with a high school diploma, without a college degree, and not really a job prospect. And so I remember the recruiter um, had come onto campus. We all took the ASVAB, and which is like the test to get into the military. Mm-hmm. And it was right about that time that he called, and I thought this might be my ticket out of out of Rancho Cordova and on to do something a little bit different. And so, joined the army just after I turned seventeen, and um, did a couple of years active. Did quite a few years um, reserve, um, and it was kind of probably during that time that. I really kind of got my feet underneath me. I was a little bit lost, I think, before then um, and taught me a number of things. You know, anybody in the, who's been in the military, I think, can attest. It really teaches you to have a really strong work ethic um, and that it's more about service than yourself. And so I think those are the two two things I really took from the military. And when I sort of transitioned into 
life back here at home, um, I think I missed that a little bit. Um, so two years in the military. Yeah, uh, ten total, but about ten. two and a half years active duty. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I show what little ignorance I have about the military. The, they say your job description is your MOS. Yes. So what? What was your MOS? What so did, uh... they've changed it since then, but I was a 98 Golf um, with Russian. And what that was, that was a crypto analyst. And so I went to an analyst school, but I had to be language qualified. So I spent a year in Monterey. That was a big part of my training in language school. And so that was a really intensive, you know, I think it was a 48-week uh, Russian language course where so we that's, came fluent. Okay, so all yeah. of this is the, there's it's all coming together. To so that, so <laughs> so place. you're fluent in Russian. So uh, all I know is net, and that's that's yeah. it. That's the extent of uh, my Russian. Well, I'll uh, teach you yes, da. So now you know yes da, and no. Net. Net. Okay, yeah, okay. Exactly. Uh, That'll not even get me an order at <laughs> Starbucks. Um, so now I guess I understand since your father was uh, an engineer, civil. Uh, aeronautical, actually. Aeronautics. Yeah, but okay. he did have a civil streak in him. I remember he built our house by himself in Truckee. He was a really smart guy like that. Well, I'm the reason I bring that up, uh, You, your graduate degree is in geosciences. Yeah. How did I get there, right? What does that make any sense? So um, that's like flipping forward about 20 years. So I actually, I got my degree in government at Sac State. And Sac that State, makes sense. Sac okay, I, a, I, I get yeah, that. Yeah, I really, I just, I love government, um, which I guess makes me a, a big, <laughs> probably bookworm nerd. They had a great program there, the United Nations program that you could participate in. And so kind of added that on. Um, but I thought with my Russian background, I'll get a government international relations degree and I'll go do something. Um, but I actually ended up falling into law enforcement um, before... When I first came back from the military, I really couldn't get a job, even with all that training. There wasn't like anything that translated to that. So I remember I worked at Pizza Hut. Um, I worked a couple of odd jobs. My stepdad's a contractor, so I did some labor jobs for him. And I worked at MCI Telecommunications. Mm -hmm. If you're under the age of 40, you have no idea what I'm talking about. I know about, what MCI right? is. Uh, but I, I worked <laughs> subsequently became Verizon. Exactly. Yeah. So I worked on the friends and family floor, sold family plans, worked as an international phone operator. I remember they um, they paid $7 an hour and I had free long distance, which again was a very big deal at the time to have free long distance. And I was at American River College. I was taking some classes because, you know, education has always been really important to me. But um, I saw a job posting for dispatcher and it paid $12 an hour with benefits. And so I thought, ooh. And I almost didn't take the job because I really liked the company I was working for. But that's when I fell into law enforcement. So flip way ahead, um, you know, finished my degree while I was working full time, you know, this is pre, but really before like internet type classes or distance education, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. showed up to Sac State, you know, four days a week and, and did my degree. Really was proud of doing that. And then um, ended up, I, I got married, I had a kid and um, realized how hard it was to work full time and be a mom and wanted to go back and get my master's kind of stopped and started, but never really finished. And so came to the point where I was, I had promoted a number of times and Sam Summers, who's our former chief, um, mm -hmm. said, you know, you're qualified to be a captain, but you really need to get your master's. And so I promised him that I would find a way to get my master's. And I looked at a lot of different programs and what I believe you should be looking for when you're looking at education is not just checking the box about getting a degree that, you know, people think that you should have, but it should really challenge you to learn something new, to become a critical thinker, you know, which is why when we hire people for our agency, I love people from all sorts of different backgrounds that have different educational experiences. Cause I just want to know that you can think that you can problem solve, that you can take on something completely new. So I had always, I love the outdoors. I love science. Like that's actually how I started. And, um, I looked at a couple of different programs and this, this one really intrigued me. I went to Mississippi state, um, and I did get a degree in geosciences, which was tough because I didn't have an undergrad in geology or any of the earth mm -hmm. sciences. So there was a lot of like extra learning that I mm -hmm. had to do to be prepared for those classes, but I love it because one of the challenges that we have with public safety, and we talk about violence, we talk about homelessness, we talk about the challenge challenges, you know, with just addiction and mental illness. But in a lot of ways, what affects all of us also has to do with kind of the natural environment around us. And you see it throughout the country, all throughout the year, that public agencies and public service agencies are really strained by the increasing amount of natural disasters we have. So for me, it was trying to understand that a little bit better and understand, you know, why that happened and how we can be 
you know, better um, public servants by by doing that. So I'm actually on a team now, um, and we're working to try and connect, uh, you know, disadvantaged and vulnerable communities uh, to make them more prepared for natural disasters. And you can certainly see that in California where you have, you know, we've had wildfires, you have mudslides, you have this like, you know, increasing climate um, issues that are really impacting, you know, all of us. Um, so that's, I guess, maybe a side thing that I do, but I do love being able to go outside and hike around and know what rock I'm looking at as a side note. Well, the, your your profile concludes, uh, you're married, three children, yeah. loves to cook, garden, and fly fish. I do. You always have to have a thing. Fishing's my thing, so... When's the last time you fly fish? Let's see. It's only it's been about a month and a half. No. Usually during the summer, I get out a lot. I, you know, I don't get a lot of time off, but um, I have a son. He's seventeen now, and our, our whole life. I mean, since he was just a little kid, that's been our thing. And so we fish together all the time. But I remember it came around because. I was a single mom with him, and I remember um, talking to someone. And they asked me, like, "What do you do for fun?" And it occurred to me, I don't really do anything for. Fun. Mm. I work full time. I'm a mom full time. There's not a lot of time for fun. And they said you should have like a hobby. And I started like really. It was kind of a self-reflective moment. I'm like, oh my gosh, I've kind of lost myself. What do I do? And the last thing that I remember really doing and enjoying all the way through growing up and, you know, even as like a young adult is I'd love to fish. And it had been like years since I had been fishing. So I joined um, a, a group of gals um, that were fly fisher people, ladies. fly okay. fisher ladies, <laughs> um, and kind of took it up again. And off I went. And that's something that I just, I love to do. There's a lot of reasons for it, you know, um, but one, the biggest thing is it just gets you out in the fresh air and, you know, the world is a beautiful place and you get you out to to experience that and gives you time to think in peace and quiet. And there's definitely some strategy involved, right? It's, mm -hmm. um, it's definitely a thinking, thinking person's uh, sport. Mm -hmm. And it's a great thing to do, you know, with um, my son. I'll tell you, there's so many... So many parents that, like, I think struggle trying to keep relationships, especially with teenagers. Um, that's been one thing I think that's been really great for us. And so... Well, welcome to the world of parenting. Yeah. I mean, uh, you've, you've <laughs> already had, uh, you have history uh, in that. So um, it is, um, it's a challenge. Yeah. It, it is a challenge. Um, I can't imagine that when you first came to the department as a dispatcher, that uh, being chief of police was on your radar. I don't think it was even on my radar a couple of years ago. <laughs> so, okay, yeah. so you're, you're yeah. leading me. Um, at what point did you, um, did just the next opportunity to promote just came up? Oh, I guess I'll take the test and see what happens. Uh, there was no uh, thought out plan for uh Chief Lester to... Uh... No, not exactly a thought out plan. You know, it's funny because when I do career development for people that are coming up, we always talk about having that plan. And the irony is I don't know that I had a great one coming up through the ranks. Um, I was given an opportunity really early on by um, one of our captains, Ricky Jones, great guy. Um, he still sits on the board over at Highlands Charter, still very involved in the community. And I was really young. I think I only had about four years on the job and he needed somebody to be an acting sergeant for one of the patrol teams. And so he told me I was going to be the acting sergeant and I really didn't think I was ready for it. Um, but, you know, he supported me and helped me through it and I learned a lot. So when the sergeant's test came along, he really encouraged me to take that sergeant's test. Again, I'm like, I only have four or five years on the job. I'm not ready at all. But he really pushed me to do it and encouraged me. And lo and behold, I became a sergeant. And it was, I think he was probably one of the most instrumental people in my career because mm -hmm. I don't think I would have sought that on my own. And I think that's incumbent on all leaders to identify people that are coming up behind you and to, you know, really encourage them to try things that maybe they don't even think that they're ready for. So I did that, um, became a sergeant, really enjoyed being a sergeant. And then there were, as opportunities came up, it was almost kind of a personal challenge. You know, one, you never want to take a job unless you're really ready for it, especially in a job like, or a profession like law enforcement, because I think you really owe it to the profession to do it the right way. So it took me a little while to feel like I was ready for lieutenant to take, you know, take that exam and move forward. Um, same thing for captain. And I never really felt like I was quite ready, but I felt like, um, you know, that, you know, we needed good people at that rank. And what you'll see in our profession is people will, they leave typically through retirements, right? And it creates a vacancy. And so you have to look at your organization and think like, well, you know, who's going to fill that 
that spot, you know, could I do a good job? You know, would I do this job, you know, the proper, um, you know, give it the proper respect that it deserves. So I never really thought, honestly, I'd make it higher than lieutenant. And then when I became captain, I thought, oh, I'm never going to, you know, that's fine. I love being a captain. Captain is great. And then um, the opportunity under Chief Han came up to be one of his second in commands. And I really like working for him. So I, um, and I had been his executive lieutenant. I thought, hey, why not? You know, if not me, who else? You know, and so had had a lot of jobs, had a lot of experience and jumped into that spot. But I guess to your question, you know, you know, why chief or when did you start really thinking about it? What you see, we've been through some very, very hard years in law enforcement and there's a lot of reasons for it. A lot of it's self-inflicted, quite frankly, um, where we should have done a better job. But if you look at the profession as a whole and you look at your major cities, there's about 70 major cities between Canada and the United States. And um, this time last year, when I was sitting at a chief's conference, they said of those chiefs, over 50 of them had retired, resigned, or had been fired since really about the beginning of the pandemic. And um, I was just at that same conference this year, and it's well over 70% now. So there's a huge vacuum of leadership and police leadership and law enforcement leadership in the country. And I really thought long and hard about, one, whether or not I could I could be a good leader for the organization if I was ready, because you certainly don't want to fail at a job like this. You know, you hurt your people um, and you hurt your community um, if you aren't able to give it your best. And sometimes I think you just don't really know if you're ready for it. And I know I've felt that way in every single job, but I have a great team. I have a great city. And when the opportunity came and Chief Han said that he was going to retire, did a lot of soul searching and decided, well, you know what? I love the city. I love our department. You know, um, I think that, you know, I can see how I think we should be moving in law enforcement. And I think it's a great opportunity and to, to do things for the profession that I've always wanted to do. And I see that in a lot of my peers. You see people, especially second in commands, that are stepping into these roles somewhat reluctantly sometimes, but really with their heart in the right place to try and do everything they can for their city and their community. Because you do need to have a, you know, not not just a strong police department, you know, but you have to have qualified people and you have to have leaders that set the culture because what we do affects so many of us. And so how can you go your entire career and then just stop at the end and say, no, I'm not going to stop right here when it really is a, a great opportunity to continue to do things that you've wanted to do or have been doing for a long time. And there's work that I'm able to do now as the chief that I started 10 or 15 years ago. Um, and I feel like I actually have the opportunity to kind of move the needle a little bit with that. As a woman, I can imagine that uh, the number of female chiefs of police uh, across the country is um, in the single digits. Three percent. Three percent. See, I didn't even have to research that one. Uh, What do you think you bring to the office um, qualified. Obviously, I'd say obviously, um, you're qualified. I would assume you would have not gotten into this position unless you were qualified. I would hope not. (laughs) (laughs) But you're female. Yeah. There's, um, there's a nexus there. And do you think that there's, uh, something unique, a perspective that, um, apart from, the 97% of folks in your position uh, have. Is there, is that something, it's, it's, it's kind of like, I guess, uh, I talked to one of my daughters one time and she was texting. I said, do you think about texting? And she looked at me like I was crazy. It's like, do you actually think what you're doing with your thumbs? Me, I'm single finger <laughs> guy. And I have, if I want a capital T, shift T. Uh, I don't know if you even think about that. You know, I, well, I think that you can have a lot of different personalities at this level. It's, um, it's, it's tough that there's not more women in leadership positions and that comes from a lot of things. Right. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges is that we hold ourselves back. Right. And, lots of times we're having to make tough choices. Like, are you, do you take that promotion knowing that it's going to be tough for you to be at your kids' soccer games on Saturdays? Cause now you're working on Saturdays. You know, what if you have a spouse that works? A lot of that work at home naturally falls back onto moms. But you're there. So you're, you're, you're there now apart from how you got there. Yeah. So you're there. So now being there, what does it, um, 
How is Am your, I different? Well, again, it's that kaleidoscope. You, you twist, you twist it. You, um, you. Everybody who looks through that little tube twists it, and they get a different view. Yeah, a different picture. Yeah. What is your picture apart, say, from the other ninety-seven percent? Well, I can tell you some of the things that has helped. That some of of my personal experience has really helped me, I think, in this job, right? I joke that I'm, you know, that everybody needs a mom, but being a mom has actually really helped me in a job like this because, you know, I mean, moms do it all in a lot of cases, right? You multitask, you work, you know, manage the finance, you make sure that there's groceries in the refrigerator, you make sure that the kids are getting to practice on time. So you're able to manage a lot of competing priorities and not to say that dads don't do that either, but I just know that I've really developed those skills over the last uh, number of years. But I also think that um, we're able to, you know, hold our kids accountable, but love them at the same time. And so, you know, you can love your team and you can love the officers that work for your department and you can support them, but you also hold them to a standard and you also hold them accountable and you can find a very kind way to do that. Um, One of the things, and I don't know if it's being a female, I don't know if it's being a mom, I don't know if it's just me, is that I've always worked as a team. And I think I learned that very young from being in the military. Um, You know, there really like I was in the army and we worked in very small unit environments and are very, very stressful situations and everyone had to do their part and we had to come together. Whether or not you agreed with somebody's perspective, whether you liked them or not, you had a job to do. So the way I see what we're doing in law enforcement right now is that there are a lot of, you know, there's a lot of competing ideas on what law enforcement should do, what they should look like, what our priorities should be. I also know that there's a lot of, you know, competing ideas about, you know, just law enforcement in general, um, good, bad, and ugly. And I think one of my strengths, and I think it goes all the way back to being 17 in the Army, is being able to bring people to the table and come up with a common solution. We all have points of commonality. We all have points of agreement. And quite honestly, I think um, we have focused too long on points of disagreement and divisiveness and points of contention between us, and we don't solve problems that why way. Why is that? Why, why, why? Oh, is a, oh, gosh, there's a lot of things. I think there's a, lot, a lack of trust in communities, especially communities of color, uh, with law enforcement. And that's a long and complicated history for sure that we have. I think, too, sometimes officers don't understand their role in the community. It's not just about enforcement, but it's about prevention. It's actually about making people's lives better, not just dealing with the task at hand. I know that we have a lot of great police officers, great human beings that wear the uniform, you know, and are looking for ways to connect with communities and looking for ways to improve communities. But I think also sometimes the public puts law enforcement kind of in this box where they only expect certain things. And so um, I think we've had our challenges. I do think that um, sometimes the private sector does it a little bit better because they're for profit and they have to make adjustments more quickly, you know, if they want to survive. Police agencies typically have a monopoly, you know, and so if you are not someone who's self-initiating change in your agency, if you're not an agency that promotes cultural change, sometimes you have to wait for incidents, significant ones, to actually drive that change. It's not how it should be, but I think that that does cause contention, you know, between communities that police departments are trying to serve, as well as, you know, police sometimes feeling like they're under attack. And so I think Now, especially the last couple of years, we've been through so much collectively that um, we know divisiveness is not going to get us the solutions that we need. And we need everybody at the table to figure out how we heal and how we move forward as a community. Everybody at the table, all voices equal? I think so. Absolutely. You know, but I also think... What if a voice is... Uh, punches above its weight or whatever, uh, it, it, it's it's louder than maybe it ought to be. That's uh, the challenge sometimes in a democracy, right? Sometimes it's the squeaky wheel that gets heard. And I think we have to be very cognizant that when we bring people to the table, that we include everybody. Um, I've seen that in law enforcement where sometimes, you know, people aren't included. But I also see that when we have, you know, uh, big discussions within our community. And I don't think you can make decisions in a bubble, especially when those decisions impact a community. And so I think often people um, are, like, for example, coming to city council or coming to their county board of supervisors, if it doesn't affect them directly, you don't necessarily hear for them or if they think they're not going to be heard. Um, and I, I think that we need to encourage everyone to get there. It's actually kind of a management principle um, that 
I subscribe to. There's a, a great book. Um, Patrick Lencioni writes something called The Advantage. And he's been um, an author of books for about management for a long time and typically does fictional writing. Um, I like this book in particular because he draws on about 20 years of management experience and management consulting. And he talks about when you're trying to bring a team together, when you're trying to bring a group together, you have to, you know, make sure that you have a workable group, but also that you call on everyone to commit to an answer or to give their opinion. Because if you don't actively and proactively do that with your team, people get missed. So internally, that's something that we do when we have teams. And my team will attest to it. I will call on everybody in the room. If you're quiet, you know, I'm going to have you speak up and give your opinion on something. Um, and I think the same holds true when we're trying to solve collective community problems. So let's do a quick word association. Community. What comes to mind? I just see a lot of different faces. I think Sacramento when I think community. Um, and I, all of a sudden when you said community, I just had all sorts of neighborhoods like sort of flash before my eyes, right? People working together, um, people kind of moving in and out. Um, Sacramento is really unique in that we're big enough to be what you would consider a big city with all of the amenities, all of the attractions, all the entertainment, all of the government you know, agencies here, but we're small enough. And I think most people would agree with me if you've been in Sacramento for a long time, but it's very rare that you go somewhere where you don't run into someone you know. And I think for us, that is a huge strength. So I always talk about that being a positive for Sacramento. And I don't think a lot of other cities have it. I actually draw back to something that Dr. Richard Pan told me a long time ago. He said, when we look at communities, we often look at them and try and figure out like what's wrong with a community? Where are they missing things? What do they need? And he's done tons of work in pediatric, um, in pediatric health and community health. And he says, when you look at communities, look at the strengths that communities have and draw and build upon what is already existing because that's really the strength and that's how you build communities. So I remember sitting and having that conversation with him at a national night out, but he's absolutely right. We have communities that are certainly challenged, but there is in every community within Sacramento, which makes up your greater community, I think that there are really just um, areas of light in every single community that we can draw on and help improve. Well, let me, let me narrow the beam, the focus, yeah. uh, word association again, Oak Park. Oak Park. I think, so going back in the day, the first thing that always comes to my mind when I think Oak Park is actually about my great grandpa. So my great grandpa was a handyman out here in Oak Park back in the 1800s. He's actually buried in the Odd Fellows Cemetery. And so I think back to historically, I think immediately, I think like old historical, you know, Sacramento going back to the early 1900s, uh, you know, when you say Oak Park. And then the next thing I flip to is my early experience here in Oak Park when Oak Park didn't look like this, right? Oak Park was very challenged. Um, and certainly Dan Hahn could speak to it better because this is his neighborhood and the neighborhood he grew up in. But what I knew about the neighborhood is it was crime ridden. You know, we had drugs, we had guns, we had, you know, homicides. Um, we had open air drug use. It was depressed. It was dangerous. You didn't feel like you were part of the neighborhood if you weren't from that neighborhood. And we policed it differently than we should have. And then I looked to see what it is now and how that has changed over the years and how that has really been community driven and what, you know, what a revilation the area is. And yet it still keeps its roots in that historical back, you know, a hundred years of history here plus um, to the challenges now what it's grown through. And so, you know, Oak Park to me, every time I drive through the neighborhood, I see something new and something that's changed and something that has moved forward in a positive direction. I think a lot of that has to do with people in the community that help this community grow and thrive. I'm running out of time. It always is, uh, it, it is, it, it's, it's the, it's just part and parcel of uh, our podcast. Um, uh, I'll just, I'll just say, Chief Lester, you have to come back and, uh, be a part of this conversation. We can't just end it here, but, uh, before I conclude, and it's like old, old preacher's ploy. It's like, oh, I'm, 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 <laughs> I'm yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm concluding right now. Yeah, right. Um, what is the average, and there's no such thing, but what are, what's the average officer in your force? Uh, that's wearing the uniform. What are they thinking? 
I think if I had to say what the average officer was, and I see a number of different faces that sort of like fly in, in front of me, I'll tell you what, we have a very dedicated group of men and women that really find this as a calling. And I think that I can prove that because over, you know, over the challenges that law enforcement has experienced, you know, if it wasn't a calling, you know, would you you know, for all the challenges there, you know, is the paycheck really worth it for the exposure to danger, the challenges that you can have in your personal life? But there is such satisfaction that comes with that. I can tell you, we all talk about how hard it is to recruit and retain people now, especially bringing people into the profession. I just talked about this the other day. About a decade ago, we had about 10,000 applications a year for police officer. This year, 2022, to date, I'm less than 700. So that tells you about people's interest really in making this a profession or a career. But having said that, the people that are continuing to walk through the door, put their name in the hat and uh, do everything it takes to be skilled in this profession are an incredible people or an incredible group of people that have you know, really different backgrounds that really have a drive to serve, um, that are here no matter what, no matter what the challenges, they show up every single day to do a good job. They want to do a good job. And they, I think, find also personal satisfaction from being able to serve. It's a side of police officers that most, most people never see because you never really get a chance to know officers in that aspect. But I can tell you from the work that I see, from how driven people are to how much they care, it is hugely inspiring. And so for as tough as our jobs are, it's great to be on a team that wants to move forward. So I'm very inspired with, you know, the younger generation of officers that are coming in. I can tell you they tweet better than I do. They know their technology and their computers. I never thought I would age myself out of that group, but they're ex exceptionally talented when it comes to technology and just being able to think very, very quickly. And I think that that should give some comfort to the city and to our community, knowing that there are men and women willing to step up to the challenge and are doing a fantastic job at what we are asking them to do. I feel like Peter Falk. This is like uh, one more thing. You know, I was, <laughs> this is Columbo. Um, I was going to ask the top three things or tw top three. You're you're all of eleven months now yeah. as chief of police. What's your number one priority right now? Yeah, easy question. It's gun violence, and I talked about that. I've been watching and witnessing, um, you know, the increase in gun violence, not just. The stats, we're not talking about numbers, we're talking about real people and real families and what that's doing to our community and to our city. And the last two years have been really almost unprecedented with the increases, not just here in Sacramento, but across the, across the country. And so when I took over the job, I knew that was going to be a priority for me to try and get guns off the streets and out of the hands of people that shouldn't have them. You know, illegal guns have no place in our society. But also there's something that drives people to violence. And that's something I think that has been unaddressed by us as a society for a long time. And I think we certainly see, you know, see that like the, really the, the terrible results um, if somebody's unprepared um, or has challenges that, that really cause them to resort to violence to resolve differences. So I think it's two part. There's definitely the enforcement, but there's the intervention and prevention piece of it too. So trying to take a holistic look at how we reduce the number of gun related injuries and, and, and deaths, quite frankly, in our community. You know, I have had a front row seat to seeing how that impacts families and how that type of trauma creates multi-generational trauma and really affects our ability to, you know, thrive as, as, a, as a society. So that's number one. Number two for me, um, I think really accountability and transparency because the what your police department does shouldn't be a secret. And I think for a long time we've operated under sort of the shroud of silence. We should be very open and honest about what we're seeing, um, about what we're having to deal with, about how we hold ourselves accountable when we do a good job, when we don't do a good job. Those are all issues of community concern. So one of the things that I was able to do before I took this job was really build out our transparency efforts. And so you'll see more from me than less. And there's things that I put out that aren't necessarily required by law, but I think it's important that the public knows knows what we're doing. So you'll see a lot come out of our office. We're very um, communicative that way. The other piece I think that's really important, um, and I think people laugh at me a little bit, but I, I talk about the customer service piece. We have great programs within our department. We really focus on youth. We really work with different community groups. And those are 
you know, all wonderful things that your police department should be doing. But I'll tell you, if the officer that comes to your house, to your call, to your accident, doesn't leave you with the feeling that they care, that they were there to help, we will never build community trust to the extent that we need it. And so that's a cultural change and something that we're really trying to do. If you look at the curriculum, we talk about being polite and professional, but we don't really talk about what it means to deliver that really good service. And I think if you've worked in a service industry, as I have, had a number of odd jobs, um, you know, custodian, I was a waitress, I was a pizza maker. Pizza Hut. Pizza, yeah, pizza, yeah, yeah. pizza Hut and Round Table. Um, and I was a seating hostess at JJ North's, you know, worked for the oh, phone wow. company. Um, having that experience and knowing that, you know, you really do need to try and pe- meet people needs and going above and beyond. It's not particularly difficult. It's just a little bit of a change in how we think. Um, And I very much appreciate that I have a handful of officers that really see the need for that and are driving that change within our organization um, because I think that's one of the key things that we can do. You know, we'll never have enough cops to handle all the calls. We'll never be able to get to everybody's call as quickly as we would like to. But when we get there, we better be able to provide good service and make someone feel like, yeah, the police department, your police department cares about you and we're here to help. Well, I have 10 other questions, (laughs) literally, um, but uh, they will have to be saved, uh, tabled until the the next time uh, you enter into this space, which hopefully will be sooner rather than later. Um, we'll give you more than 11 months of uh, of, uh, on the job uh, uh, to report out. But Chief Lester, thank you so very much uh, for your service. Um, just, just thank you for everything that you're bringing to the office and to the community. Uh, we definitely are praying for and with you. And um, we look forward to that time again when you can come back and uh, we can ask you even more questions. Thank you. Honored to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you.